Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to Trek Chat. Thank you so much for joining us. I am your usual host, Sean, uh, from Trick on the Tube. I am joined today by two wonderful people, two positive Trekkies that support Star Trek in all its many faces. Uh, one is a returning guest, Chris the Trek Collector. Thank you so much for joining me. Anytime, Sean. And uh, the other is his partner in crime, the uh, second of the Nerdscape podcast. Well, there's three of them now. Yep. <laughs> so two of the three. Drawn family. Uh, Damien, Damien, a.k.a. the Irish Trekkie. How are you doing? I'm doing good, doing good. Very happy to be here to talk Trek. Happy days. Yes. Talking Trek, as always. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I have to say that you guys and the Nerdscape podcast inspired me to make Trek chat so it's meaningful. And also <laughs> watching Damien love on all of these ships and, and buy all of these models is what not, not only inspired me to make my channel and start talking about Trek myself, but you also had me spend a lot of money <laughs> on buying Eagle Moss things. I no both regrets. love that and uh, apologize <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. No regrets. I'm very happy. I'm happy with all my ships. I just don't have enough money to get all the ones I want. I know. <laughs> it's a good but, problem. Um, it's a good problem. It's a, you know, if you're going to have a problem. It does those starships are like an addictive drug <laughs> oh they are and the more mm. shows we get the more ships i want so it's it's terrible it's i know it's terribly right? amazing just while we're on that topic if anyone wants a cool way and if they do have space in their house if you know of a shop called little i think damien's purchased these as well they do mm. display cabinets nice big ones and i purchased three a while black and the three cabinets will fit your 180 collection no bother so there you go. There's a nice little tip. So, and I think they're normally around 60 euro or something, which is absolutely incredible. They're fantastic display cases. So, there's mm. a little tip for you. Keep an eye on little. Do they have? Do they have um, gaps? Yep. Or is it like completely sealed? Uh, the, the display cabinet. They're glass. The 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 side. There's two side panels glass. Uh, mm. for two front doors. You don't have to put the handles on the doors, which is really cool. So you can just leave them off. So you've literally got a lot of glass and then you get, I think, about 10 glass shelves, which are fairly adjustable. So like I've even got my Deep Space Nine special issue in that cabinet, which fits fine. It does. Uh, you can adjust the shelves. So like there's no issue with it. It's actually their ideal. It's just finding uh, the wall space <laughs> to mount them. <laughs> is, is it doesn't get too dusty, though. No, no. They're actually, sealed. Nice. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. See, that's my main issue. I have them on the... Uh, in the background but like dust just gets all over them i mean my you know my captain proton ship is black and white anyway so it doesn't matter but the rest <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> well I, I, a couple of other cool things is there uh, i did the ds9 backing thing so i got what you call it one of the posters from ds9 where i think uh it's cool and that actually fits perfectly into the cabinet as a background mm. so like you're talking movie poster sizes can actually genuinely fit into it. and then i oh, think wow. eagle moss did as well with the discovery collection if you were initially going back if you got the the posters from hero collection collector for the discovery line they actually fit perfectly into those cabinets as well yeah. so you know it's it's cool like you can actually get like some nice cool backdrops in there so just complete it hmm. oh wow well, there you go pro tips he's already hitting us with those pro I'm tips telling you. <laughs> in for the kill straight away um <laughs> We are talking about, uh, not specifically Starship models, but we are talking about Starships today. That's the theme. I've got, I've got my Starship lovers, my Starship fans, and so who better to talk about ships than these guys? Um, I don't know. We, we can start simple. What's your favorite ship, I guess? Ooh, is that I a mean, simple question? That first. That's, that's, that's never a simple question. <laughs> what's my favorite? Uh, yeah, that's a loaded if you question. Have one. You know, that's like, Do you even have that's one? like picking a child, you know? Um, but... I'd say y y you never forget your first. Like my first Enterprise was the Enterprise D. Um, I that was my introduction to Star Trek. So uh, I'm so used to, and if 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 ever I hear Star Trek, um, I'm sure that's one of my go to memories as well as TNG. So seeing the the mighty luxurious Galaxy class flying through, but um, it does change. It does change mood to mood. Um, and again, like I loved seeing the Discovery kind of evolve in front of our eyes as well in, in the world of social media too so discovery has a, a little place in my heart as well so they're my two okay for me it is gonna I, i'm actually gonna be the same as damien in a sense uh, it's my first love it's gonna be 
the Connie, the original where it all began, the original Enterprise to refit between the two of them. I'm always stuck, but again, I think it is it, it is very true. Like it, the first show that you see, the first hero ship, always has a warm place in your heart. It's kind of like the starting point of the ship addiction. <laughs> It is. I, I love Voyager, the show, very much, and so I love the ship very much. But when I look yeah. at them, I have a tendency of thinking it's the, um, the refit, like the Enterprise refit that they did for the movies. I think yeah. that's my favorite ship. Mm. It is peculiar, though, because as you were saying, Damien, when someone says Star Trek, I have, I don't have like a specific image, but I have a feeling of the Enterprise D that kind of pops into my mind yeah. because I feel like that's a ship that that represents the franchise so much. I know technically that Connie represents the franchise, but... Mm. The Enterprise D, I don't know, it's just so so iconic, I guess. It's the Rolls Royce of the fleet, as I always call her. I think it's probably <laughs> looking at the way um, Star Trek is panning out and the way how the show is evolving. I think that's probably going to be, if, if we ever look back to Trek history at the moment, it's probably going to be the glory day of the Federation, the, like, the galaxy-class starship in a golden yeah. era of peace. So, yeah, it, it is an iconic ship. It, it's a beautiful ship. And, you know what I mean? Andrew Probert and Rick Sternback. And, you know, a lot of, like, you know, Andrew Probert did a lot of work on the D. You know, he was, you know, greatly involved with the, the refit. So, you know, it shows the love. Um, it, it was great as well, like, hearing stories about how Rick got, got involved with the next generation as well. Just You know what I mean? Hearing that the show was coming back on radio and then straight away ringing up. <laughs> to get a job <laughs> which is just you know priceless you know <laughs> but um, yeah the, the, the D is just I think it was really one of the first ones in the show where we just seen the whole aesthetic of Star Trek The Next Generation just take its lease of life the aesthetics going down and the love with the Akutas with the Akuta grounds the, but the thing about Star Trek and I've been thinking about this more and more especially since getting the invite to the show and we're talking about what we talk about um y y you brought up about representation of star trek and i think star trek is quite unique in the fact that it has shapeshifted from the 60s right up to now whereas if you look at other franchises let's say to be polarizing here star wars um <gasps> that's has yeah, star wars by the way hey listen i, I love star wars too <laughs> but um we all do. the the aesthetic has uh, kind of remain true to the original movies through to the animated series and stuff like that so like if you think about an x-wing you know exactly what you're talking about the imperial star destroyers and stuff whereas mm. i think star trek affords the opportunity to fans to have their own representation of it so like uh, chris you mentioned about the original constitution class um i'm i i can guarantee there's fans out there that have never watched tos so it's always been voyager or um you know archer and the crew as well so i, I think it's one of the nice curiosities of star trek that uh, it has had so many faces that people can just subscribe to a very small portion of it you know i went all heavy yeah. there <laughs> no 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 it's 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 it's, it's perfect because Star Trek is unique in a sense that like I can recognize, generally speaking, some some of those obscure Enterprise or Voyager ships maybe were inspired by other franchises when you look at them. Mm. But generally speaking, you could recognize a Star Trek ship um, apart from like any other franchise. Even if every show and every era has their own kind of aesthetic, they have their own design philosophies. Yeah. Like you can tell a, an original series ship apart from an Next Generation ship, but you can still feel like they're Star Trek. They're not. They're not from the bones. They're not from, uh, Blade Ru Blade Runner mm. or, or Alien or whatever. Yeah, well, I think that the, the easiest one to to look at that is like the jump to the reimagined Star Trek, as I would call it, because it kind of shifts away. If you go through, say, the original series in the aspect that, like, kind of Damien was going with Star Wars, where Star Trek initially stayed true up until the nineties, uh, the nineties. You know the aesthetic of a ship you took the connie and you looked at the connie and you either went forward in design or you went backwards with the nx01 but then you move to say discovery and at the same time is you know it's it's changed a lot with the starships but as you just said there you know it's star trek straight off even though discovery has longer nostalgia 
it's bigger in scale for whatever reason the decision was on that one. That's one little <laughs> gripe that I do have on it. It's got a roller coaster but inside it. <laughs> it's got a roller coaster inside it, but at the same time, it's, oh, I hate that. It's a Star Trek ship. You it know, is. it's a Star Trek ship, and I think the best mm. representation, like when when the show first aired, was the Sh- Shinjo, which was just like, whoa, oh, you know what I mean? It's such such a brilliant design by by John Eaves. And, you know, it fits that era perfect because if you look at it, it's like it's a tank compared to the NX-01. So, you know, very, very true in style mm. with that design aspect. Discovery is just so out there. But again, it's a hero ship and I think it's allowed to be completely different and yeah. away from the regular norm. But still, it stands out as a Federation ship. Mm. I think Voyager was pretty different when it, when it came out. Oh yeah, like well, I was I was really young when when these shows began. But Voyager, look, look like in comparison to like the Enterprise D and other ships, even if the movies were kind of uh, actually, how many movies were out before Voyager came out? Not that much. One? No, there wasn't. Um, the next was. generation, there was what you call it. There was literally uh, generations, if I remember rightly. Oh, generations was, was in production was yes, and what happened so Voyager then? Voyager was far out there. Voyager and Voyager was being designed the same time as the Enterprise E. Um, mm. There was a huge kind of hullabaloo about mm. whether they were going to reuse a Galaxy class, and they went ahead and said, "No, we'll do a new ship." So what basically happened, and this is quite funny, John Eves went off on his own. He was working on First Contact, and Rick Sternbach went off and he was working on the new hero ship for Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, and both, you know, working miles apart from each other. Um, not looking over each other's shoulders, came up with a different saucer style compared to the round circular one, which is very, very interesting. And it's one of those cool things when you when you hear designers talk, you know, how do you take, you know, a circle for a saucer section, two nacelles, you know, and a secondary hull, <laughs> and how do you evolve on that? And the other thing what the two designers also did was they removed the next section from their ships. Blended body, yeah. So it was... Yeah, so it was funny in a way that, like, you know, when Voyager came on screen, not long after that, we had First Contact and we had the Enterprise E, and the two of them really just kind of really fell into place. Mm. And the two designers weren't even collaborating, which is really interesting. Like minds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Voyager is, like, again, when you've seen Voyager for the first time, it was just such a perfect little ship and. It is definitely one of the favorite hero ships out there. It's just everything about it. It's a great ship as well. Like um, watching on TV, I have to say, it's like fantastic. Year to Hell was wow. Uh, it's it's got a great personality. I never, I don't know if I ever fully accepted the tiny nacelles though. I don't know, but it's a be- like- it's, it's still a great ship though. In all fairness, <laughs> hey. would you like the nacelles that lift up? Oh yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and any dynamic part in a, in a ship, I'm all for, you know. Um, but one one interesting thing that uh, came up in a conversation um, with John E's once was that um, one of the one of the right the, one of the important elements to the design was that um, the Enterprise E was being designed for widescreen, you know, whereas the Enterprise yeah. D was designed for a four to three aspect ratio. So that's why it's. Uh, not super long and uh again it wouldn't be captured on screen in one go uh for the viewing audience so because the enterprise e was birthed in cinematic glory and like around that time I, maybe voyager would have been the same, the same as rick, well so i'd say rick yeah if i I'd so say the long and beautiful that, designs say, yeah mm. so where the ship went longer which would make sense as well that rick probably got that brief as well because you got to yeah. realize as well around that time as well all of a sudden the the big thing that was in was the widescreen tvs Do you remember the big massive boxes take advantage of them <laughs> yeah all these other things that you'd never consider until yeah. you like the well, square tv was gone at that point yeah it actually ties in well with like discovery and how um like everyone making discovery it's it's very cinematic now isn't it like these new shows discovery but god they're all very cinematic the the shows that we watch are completely widescreen um yeah. and so of course you have those very elongated nacelles on the, on the discovery mm. Mm. that makes sense too yeah 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 and again like it's um cool. one of the things about like discovery that I really liked was the variety in ships um like the discovery long kind of slender nimble nacelles maybe a bit too long in all fairness but you have the shenzhou and you have um the 
the Clark and so on so on there's so many varieties of ships there um, kind of a little something for everybody which is great yeah and I, I think that that era with, with Star Trek to me like if you look at like 100 years before that you got the NX-01 and you got the, the birth of the Federation so forth and one thing mm. I do like about Discovery is there's such a broad range of starships where I know people would kind of give out and say, if you look at TOS, there was like, you know, the Connie was the best one. And there was, you know, you never, but the thing was, we never seen other ships. And to me, like a hundred year progress of alien species working together, you should have a wide variety of ships at mm. this point. And again, with the Klingons, different war and houses, you know, that, you know, discoveries mapped it out that like, you know, each family was for themselves. And if you know the story then with the Klingons later on is that, you know, yeah, now we get the D seven. So, you know, mm. all the families have their one ship. It's advancement in technology. The Klingons houses are now working together. The Federation are fine tuning their illustrious fleet, as you could say. And like, yes, you have the Connie, but like discovery. Okay. has a spore, a spore drive. So it does look completely different. So I'd never be kind of one of the boo boys to say, oh, how come the Federation has so many ships? Of course they should have loads of ships. You know, at this point, it's like, take bits from that one, take bits from this one, take bits from this one. This is what we have. Okay, mm. we know that the Connie is the best ship that we have. So we're going to put everything into that ship and we move forward. And that's then you get your kind of basic Federation fleet, yeah, which is kind of cool. And it, it can explain why the Excelsior has been in service for fucking God knows how long. Because, you know, it was just a perfect hull that you could literally take tech out and put new tech in mm. and kept it up to date without having to massively rebuild new ships. Because even the story with the Galaxy class starship, like it was like seven years, I think, on the drawing board before it was even built. So it just shows the foresight. The, yeah. Yeah. The technology advances of starship design, you know, from the TNG aspect. So I, I, I like the quirkiness and the differences of ships in Discovery. Um, I like what John Eves had to do with Discovery itself because, you know, this was obviously... An, uh, Brian Fuller got this into his head. He wanted square nacelles. Didn't want round, for whatever reason that was. But to go back to Ralph's concept artwork for the Enterprise, uh, which wasn't used, and to quirk on that and make the Discovery... I think I think John did a great job uh, not easy <laughs> you know what I mean it's not easy ever going back it's like you know but if you look at his work then on the the Enterprise it's absolutely fantastic again um, and I think you know safe hands I, I think Scott Snyder had, had had a bit to play in that as well and I just think you know what I mean when you get the right people involved sometimes they can just take an existing design and reimagine it and i like it's amazing how many people have turned around and commented and said that was the ship that should have been in the jj movies which is a real pat on the back to the guys and it's no offense to the guys that designed the jj but again you're dealing with jj and he has his he has his brief you know what i mean he wanted a hot rod enterprise and yeah that's what that's what we got you know and in I'm fairness, fine with that yeah that's an ultimate oh, universe. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely and if if you look at it then as well again like you look at ryan churchill's aspect and take on it then as well he improved on that design again by the last jj movie you you know he, mm. he refined it again and a lot of fans then like you know all of a sudden the, the, the jj enterprise was kind of like a little bit hated upon well but by the end of it everyone was kind of like oh to weigh in nice. um i know like the the rebooted enterprise got a little bit of a slack but if you if you do a basic google search for the enterprise concept art you'll find one from ryan church where it had mm. the orange deflector and the uh the copper deflector and the orange bu uh, bizarre yep. collectors and it looks like an absolute gem of a ship yeah some of the similar elements that did make it to screen but again design is committee uh, by committee when it comes to tv shows and movies so again the producers yeah. get the final say you know but um i think it was sean hargreaves that did the refinement and beyond oh sorry sean. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right yeah. and um i was I, I would have loved to have seen his take in more and more detail of the enterprise a um or was it the refit or an a I think it was the A that got built at the end. Yeah. Um, but that looked very interesting as well. But again, a different, Sean, yeah. different aesthetic, yeah. so to say. 
and again, yeah, you, well, you do go back to the, to the concept artwork where, you know, and sometimes like it's, it's it can be very, very hurtful, you know, when you see people like bash a designer straight off the bat, like go and research, you know, most of these designers have like their art pages up and they're, they're very fond of publishing, like say concept artwork. And as Damien said there, like if you, if you looked at the initial concept artwork for the enterprises for that movie you will actually be amazed how similar they looked to what we were used to so you know instead of just blaming the designer you know maybe look at the producers <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's the thing you have to deal with like a, a committee of producers and, and executives but there's also the artistic vision of the like the the director and the person that's behind the project exactly and case in point so because i i had a look at the um I had to look at the Klingons. This isn't ships, but I had to look at the, the, the Klingon concepts that they had. And like, so JJ approved a Klingon that I wouldn't have went with. Mm. But when I looked at like the other concepts, it was like, these these are amazing. Yeah. Mm. Like they, they, they were Klingons that very much reminded me of the next generation, but just kind of upgraded or visually, just visually better for, for like the on screen, for the, the movie screen. So, yeah. yeah. And if you look at like, um, I'm going to name drop here, collector in there because they're awesome. But um, the content that they have in their magazines for their ships and they do episode breakdowns and like uh, sets and costumes as well. But when you look at a designer's um, concept art for a ship, rarely yeah. does the do they only draw one picture, for example, or model one. And uh, sometimes you will open up a magazine going, I would have chosen that ship rather than the one that made it to screen because that was the bomb. You know, it was awesome. But um, yeah, they they get paid to do the gig. Someone else makes the end call and uh, tells them, make that a bit smaller or that's too recognizable or, you know, whatever. Um, so there's a lot that goes into making these shows. Um, it does take a village. But, uh, you know, in the era of social media as well, it's it's very quick uh, to criticize and oh, yeah. uh, come down on people. But uh, listen. On that point, actually, funny enough, going back to that, like uh, if you look at the Enterprise E, the first concept that was signed off was actually with the the nacelle pylons swept forward very mm. similar to voyager and the fact of the matter was when it was down someone turned around and goes oh we got a turkey prize because it was around close to thanksgiving <laughs> and yeah. because the producers literally heard the reference of a turkey the design was crossed so right. back to oh, the, wow. the original drawing board so mm. you know it, it just goes <laughs> to show <laughs> you know what i mean what way people will look at stuff so it, it, it is fairly fairly interesting but again like if you look at rick moving the, when the voyagers and the cells go up the pylons are kind of like forward and john had the same vision again so it's it's it's, it's really mm. kind of uh you know it, it's always down to producers but like the guys that like work on these shows put in so much effort and the hours that they work in and like we we had the the look to meet ryan denning um <laughs> such a cool guy and he's worked on the expanse mm. And he came to Discovery there, I think, season two. So, like, he was the man behind the Section 31 ships. And again, like, you know, absolutely beautiful mm. ships. Um, I like the fact that they don't have cloaking technology. They're stealth, um, which is really, really cool. And I like the whole, you know, going the approach that they're black ships and, you know, going through, you know, makes sense in space. And looking at, yeah. <laughs> Well, it makes a lot of sense. But if you look at the stealth ships uh, in the 80s, 90s, like the Blackbird and what was the other one? You uh, know, I mean, they were stealth, they were black. Yeah, the F-117. You know, yeah. this, that's the one, yeah. So, like, it, it just where they go and get pull these ideas out are really, really cool. Well, the fun thing is, going back to... Um... To, like the concepts and concept designs that aren't necessarily approved you like you design three ships they choose one mm. like discovery they went back and got like an original concept and then they reworked it you know that like when you're creating for star trek even if they don't pick your design like your preferred design as a creator this time around maybe 15 10 years down the road someone's going to go get that ship mm -hmm. and reimagine it or use that design because that's what that's what Star Trek does. It, it recycles and reuses the talent that it has. Yeah, yeah. there was what you call it. The, somebody, one of the episodes, one of the ships. I think it's the Federation tug. Is literally, um, it wasn't per se designed by John Eves. It was basically a visual effects guy taking his own time. And what he did was he kind of kit bashed uh, uh, visual effects, different sections of ships. So 
it's the new way of kit bashing as like Rick back in the day would have just taken the AMT model kits and you know bang 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 and then we've got a couple of highlighters on it you know made out of um, razor blades <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know what I mean interesting enough that when they have all these 3D files and like I'm just going to take the saucer section off this I'm going to take the nacelles off this I'm going to take this part this part merge it together and now we've got a new kit back bash ship mm. but I also seen someone as well like uh, somewhere on on social media posted up as Damien said like he wasn't too keen on the discoveries along the cells and someone decided to shorten <laughs> the cells on the discovery so you know what I mean and you know there you go and it, it, it's another ship <laughs> yeah yeah which is really really cool and I, I suppose it's, it's always the fun about Star Trek as well like there's a lot of kip bashing involved so regardless if it's if it's 3D rendering where you're, you're kit bashing the new way of kit bashing I suppose it's compared to the old school of just getting AMT kits and taking bits and pieces and as Damien said highlighters maybe uh, parts of razors <laughs> mm-hmm. and just adding them onto your ship you know there's always so much you can do with a, a, a Federation Starship which is really really cool yeah <laughs> okay so you're talking about kit bashing as in like literally bashing kits together the old school yep. way do you guys think there's uh do you guys prefer the new like the the new CG model like the CG ships that we have rather than like the old school models that we used to have? Do you think they have pros and cons both of them? Cuz maybe you have more freedom. It's getting more I'm difficult now to make that uh to kind of argue against digital because the lighting and the technology has just come on so much. Um there's an artistry to model making. And that can give a lot of benefits for like lighting uh, and doing the, the, the passes for filming. But you just get so much more freedom. And like you mentioned about Discovery being cinematic, um, the the rendering capabilities of uh, Pixmondo and stuff like that, they've, they've done a great job. Not perfect, but tremendous. And you get to have a lot more freedom with like battles and uh, camera views and, you know, panning from outside through inside the ship as well. So... I think I think in, in the end the digital models have definitely won for me, but um, the models, the practical uh, models, still hold a little spot, and I love seeing them on the the ships themselves, even on the wall or something like that. But uh, yeah, to me, I, I I love the practical models. It's just always nice to know that there is a ship out there, you know, in a studio uh, on our lock and key. But <laughs> the problem is, as Damien said, like you know, if you go back through every single episode where they were using a practical kit it's it's reuse of, of stock footage um it's very mm. expensive to film yeah these things you know and also as well then you're talking about blowing up kits um you know the the, the way you're doing it now is definitely cgi unfortunately but to me there's, a, there's always going to be a warm place for the actual physical model like i i know like if we go into the Orville, they have a practical uh, physical model, but I wonder how much of that has actually ever been used. Very um, little, very little. Yeah, you know. So. What about the Mandalorian? I feel like I think the Mandalorian they use um, a physical model for their for the hero ship, don't they? They built a small mm. six foot model, um, mainly. Mm-hmm. They did ship passes, I think. I saw. Behind yeah, the scenes of yeah, that. and it's like, and again for the lighting because of the the chrome styling to it as well. And um, they're using some fantastic technology on that show, especially with the dynamic sets mm. that they're using as well. But um, oh, like yeah. Gone are the massive, massive models. But like, yeah, I still think there's six foots being done occasionally for certain shots. But again, oh, like open, the open lighting is getting on great. As you said, Sean, there like the, the ship passes and stuff like that, where you know it's going to be, they're perfect for a model. But realistically, when you go into, say, battle scenes and so forth like that, that's where there's a huge drawback. And, like, you know, from TNG, the lack of seeing the massive action that we see in Star Trek Discovery, you know, like, it, the last scene, like, I think was a bit, I think it was a little bit OTT. <laughs> it was a bit point, hot, you know what hot I mean? mess, yeah. You know what I mean? You lost, <laughs> but, like, there's no way you would have got that in TNG, um, you know, using physical models but look at voyager yeah. not close to it in deep space nine yeah close to it but that was actually cgi <laughs> it was yes yeah. towards the end if you're talking about the the famous battle scenes yeah cgi oh, and yeah. if you actually look at true true remastered stuff um it actually gets very funny because the placement of the ships is very kind of um static 
static. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's like <laughs> copy paste, copy paste, yeah. all in a straight line. Yeah. Um, which was well, really they're cool. they're almost lined up on a grid. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. So uh, now yeah, the remastered like, battle that was on the DS9 documentary was absolutely jaw dropping, um, yeah. and that's a testament to the skill at the time. You know, um, brought up to a. Uh, uh, for, uh, I'm, I've lost the terminology, you know, ultra high definition. Ultra yeah. HD. Um, it's still, I that that stood the test of time so amazingly, you know. But oh, it will stand the test. It was one of the best battle scenes, especially mm. at that time, and for CGI. You yeah. know what I mean? So new technology, and yeah, it, <laughs> goosebumps. <laughs> mm. I never noticed. Um, and I said like rewatching all of Star Trek in these maybe three, four recent years. Um, and as an adult, I've paid more attention to, well, basically every aspect of the show, but I paid more attention to like the CG models and to like when it was actual physical models. I didn't have too many complaints when it came to CG models on Voyager or Deep Space Nine. It was really with Enterprise that I, sometimes I felt like I was watching like a video game. Um, and it happens a lot when, when it's characters on screen, you know, they have those wide shots and you see a bunch of humans or people walking around and they don't, they look a bit janky, Mm. but some of those ships on Enterprise looked pretty fake. Yeah. Um, c- yeah. Com- like, compared to what they were doing on Voyager sometimes. The, d- the detailing was phenomenal on them. Like, cause we saw like so many variants of, uh, um, Klingon ships, for example. But again, mm. uh, it, it, my eye would always be drawn to the, the lighting of the model. Um, you're able to kind of naturally light a physical model. Um, because they did all the different passes uh for those but again technological limitation i think and because like tv quality was increasing around that time you know the early 2000s um i don't think the technology was still up there uh to kind of hide the mistakes that uh voyager could probably get away with on like a traditional tv or standard definition you know but that's right enterprise was the first show to actually be released in 720p i believe so i believe so the one interesting thing actually got, got got like when you move away from the physical models to CGI, one thing that kind of stops a huge argument is, say for the Eagle Moss, I'd say it, it's a blessing in disguise. Any ship that's CGI, they tend to nail the color correctly. When it comes down mm. to a physical model, everything changes because you like people don't realize. Okay, so what paint scheme are you going? Okay, so let's take a photograph of the practical model with your camera with natural light mm. the ship looks completely different so but you know you put it on the screen and you have all your light passes and all that it's a different color um you know depending on what's going on you know like if you look at the deep space nine you can see even through cgi and stuff like that and the color a deep space nine can change rarely with different lights mm. but when you have a cgi complete model that the color scheme doesn't seem to change as much as you know and like star trek fans are very big on looking at their physical models and like if you're doing modeling and so forth like that what a lot of people always reference is the actual physical model as Mm. opposed to how it looks on screen and you know you can be surprised the difference between you know going from the physical model look in natural light to what it actually appears on screen there's a huge difference so i'd always i always kind of laugh when people kind of give out about colors say of certain starships they got that color wrong and all that like i think one that eagle moss did was the argo the shuttle mm. and it kind of looks a kind of a kind of a, a coppery pewtery kind of. gold kind of yeah and mm. obviously they took that cgi footage from when it's on the planet <laughs> you know what i mean and they went with that paint color yeah. so that's kind of this proof well, there's, there's, there's this there's this um basically like a heat filter that they threw on that movie in that in that sequence anyway like, like the, the planet. Yes. planet it's yeah. hot everything's and yellow that's where they took things orange and that's probably you know in fairness to eagle moss on that one now, that that doesn't really help my case because normally you wouldn't ever see that with a cgi model anymore but you know they obviously took that scene for a reason probably to get more accurate detail or stuff like that whatever way they scream grab because i know they were missing a lot of practical models mm. which is always a hard thing to redo and rebuild and the stargazer is uh, actually but, yellow not many people know that, you know. Uh, no, it's not <laughs> yellow. That's in the cards. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, um, it's the it's the USS Discovery, 
that I always have the like sometimes like on screen sometimes I feel like it's much more copper sometimes I feel like it's more silver and when they released the physical when Eagle Moss released the physical model it's clearly this kind of orangey copper mm. color yeah um but I, I sometimes I see that on screen sometimes I don't and I don't know if it's because of the lighting or like if they're in a cave system or something but there was a he, there was a massive it's... like if you look at season one of Discovery um they have like a blue filter on every uh space yeah, scene whole, you know the whole thing is and um that kind of lessened through season two which i was a big fan of um mm. like oh, i God. i i was looking forward to just regular space shots in discovery instead of having a nebula in every scene <laughs> you know it's like space clouds. can be boring you know uh space clouds but um yeah there was uh again someone's choice to have that blue filter on but yeah i definitely would subscribe to what you were seeing as well that the color was shifting throughout you know i think though on the argument with the cgi i think realistically what you can look forward to is when the likes of eagle moss have the actual correct cgi files and they're given to them what we mm. end up as a collector is fairly fairly accurate because i know you know going back to the, the 180 collection there was you know gripes over certain ships now you got to remember these are physical models so a cgi file has to be done to make these ships be manufactured mm. and the great aspect of when you move the cgi and you have the cgi renders and they're handed over to eagle moss we can clearly see that in the likes of the star trek discovery collection where you know all the ships have come out absolutely perfect yeah which is absolutely brilliant from a collector's point of view because that's what you want you want accuracy so yeah uh the old model and cgi thing is will always be a hard debate yes i love the the, the, the practical model but you know if i'm getting more accurate ships <laughs> i suppose cgi wins at the end of the day and great stories you wouldn't have a, a year in hell that that could never have been possible with the, no, the practical no, model no, unli yeah. unless they invested in building it but um yeah great storytelling oh, device true that's very true. Sometimes I feel like, um, and I don't know how much it costs to actually like have someone design all of these different ships, but and I suppose spoilers for the, the finale of, of Picard, I would have I would have enjoyed seeing a little more variance in that fleet that pops up at the end. There is slight variances mm. in three or four of the ships, but I just think again with that production looked well rushed. Um, I don't think it was actually final. Like, I don't think the guys were given a chance to properly iron out that last scene, which is a letdown, um, which yeah. is unfortunate. Um, it, you know, like, Discovery's been pushed off, and, you know, hopefully we'll see it on screen. It gives the visual effects team a lot more chance to finish their work and have it right um because it, it 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 is annoying like you know uh, even if you're an actor like for star trek the card like you're doing all your acting right and everything else is fantastic up, up to the last part and this huge battle scene and it comes into and you can't make out the ships mm. or you can't make out the definite you like you can't make out a deflector dish you can't make out the simple things that just seem to be missing off those ships so it'll be interesting because like uh, ben robinson announced that like riker's ship will be one of the first four from picard I know Star Trek Online have... They've done a great version, version of it. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Eagle Moss comes up with because they normally get the actual render. So it'll be interesting to see, like, have they... I, I'm sure they've finished off that design. So it'll be an, interesting to see afterwards what those ships truly look like. But mm. that's such a letdown, you know, for us ship geeks that want to see your ships really really clear and closely and i think that was the problem with the discovery battle scene where yeah it was it looked cool and the whole idea of this big massive battle and all these probes and fighters going around but there was too much and sometimes too much yeah. you just can't make out the small details that you know you've got guys that are putting a lot of work and effort into these models <laughs> And if you've mm. got like 400 of them floating around on screen, you ain't going to see them. So, you know, you, you could put a bloody big pen in there, you know, and have that flying around with a little <laughs> yeah. engine thruster at the back yeah. and you probably wouldn't make it out. So, But like, look yeah. at the first contact Borg battle, you know, that that oh. was great. But like, it's not like you're seeing 100 ships on screen. You're seeing a few of them kind of doing tactical dives and phaser and quantum torpedo volleys. Yeah. And that's just like 
all and going in in waves. You, you know, you know, you have four or five federation ships going in in a wave. They're doing their attack run. They're pulling out, and then the next five or six wave come in, and that's yeah. You can make that out. You know, we're all only like producers will go, oh yeah, let's do this big massive space battle. <laughs> but there's yeah. only so much the human eye can take hmm. sitting down and watching it now. Unless you want to stop it frame by frame and watch, hell, probably be brilliant. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how we you watch have TV. to find someone that knows how to direct this stuff yeah because, like you you have directors they know how to direct action films some directors know how to direct you know comedy but i feel like like space battles you have to know how to direct this because you can't just have like a wide shot of like all of these things zooming around you don't you don't see anything no, that's actually a- so uh, what, what you guys are saying like, the, like you have one ship pass in front of the camera so you really see what that ship looks like you see what it's doing it's either getting hit by a phaser the shields come up or, or it's throwing a volley of you know uh, torpedoes then you focus on another like another squad of ships like four ships that really gives you a sense of what's going on in the battle and it also enables like the artists to really get their designs on screen and you can really see yeah, the models yeah. and the needs variants. to be choreographed I think that, yeah that goes back to I think here's a point where you know you go back to say the models again and ILM which were great for years, Star Wars, Star Trek, any big sci-fi. And you know what I mean? They would get their storyboards no more than a director would have to work with. You have your little storyboards with the little artwork and what they kind of want. And like ILM at the point could turn around and go, here, look, unless you want to blow your whole movie budget, you know, cop onto yourself, tone it down. We can only do this. Exactly. And they, they were in a position to turn around to say, Star Trek, doesn't matter who the director was, like, you know, cash talks. Mm. So ILM would turn around and say, look, you're being ridiculous. So say if we're using practical models and that last battle scene in Discovery, ILM probably would have turned around and goes, you're having a laugh. We're mm. not touching it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> we will do it, but you know what I mean? You're going to blow, you know, the cost of three yeah. seasons to do this one battle sequence. Mm. But then you come into, you know, guys working on a computer and doing these. And it's very hard for these guys to turn around and say to a producer that's putting pressure on you and saying, I want this big elaborate battle scene. And I do think you're kind of right. You need to kind of get that person that has worked at this for a long time and say, no, my team's not doing that. That's, you know, you're going, get where you're going. Okay, we'll do one way your way, but let me do it my way and see what you think is better. Mm. So, mm-hmm. but the problem is in Hollywood, how <laughs> things very hard to outdo the ego of a producer and at the same time as well you know that's why they are producers you know what i mean that you have to have that ego to kind of you know part of the job yeah exactly Mm. so but i do agree i do think you know definitely get someone that can stand up to a a director and say here man (laughs) no 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 no. let's tone it down a bit you know let's let's make this class let's make the viewer go whoa as opposed to what the is going on (laughs) So t- talking about um, kind of what makes the Star Trek models unique and what makes them, you know, the the, the, the variances and the differences we can go to, what do you guys think of La Serena? How different is that? Because I felt like that didn't really feel like a Star Trek ship. Then I got used to it. I, once we'd seen the 10 episodes, I was fine with it. Especially considering it's like supposed to be a civilian ship, from what I understand. It is a what civilian ship. think of it? And to it's me, red. Uh, to me, I, I'm not... I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I'll be straight honest, but like I like the direction that they're going with it. Um, it's a civilian ship. It shouldn't look Federation. Um, just not too keen on it, but it fits its captain. So, you know, it has <laughs> it has a lot going for it. You know, it's a different style. It's it it's different. Um, would it have been a choice for me as a hero ship? Uh, I suppose it, it goes in your storyline, so it fits into, you know. Um, the captain and how Picard got on board it so yeah I, I'm not too keen on her um, I just I, I just don't think she films well I thought the Fenris Ranger ship was absolutely beautiful <laughs> I thought it looked great um, I think the Romulan ships looked absolutely fantastic um, so it's a hard one for me I'm not the biggest fan of it I gotta say that but I can see, again, you're going on a direction from producers and stuff like that. So I can see the idea behind it. And if you go with the idea, it fits to me. But I just, not a ship that I like. Hmm. I'm waiting for, 
I'm waiting for the personality of the ship to show itself because um like it's not a federation ship so it's going to be different um it's kind of hot roddy in colors and it has um it has an interesting name and it has like graphics on the outside of it as well the, the la serena but um you know it's it does fit it's captain it's yeah yeah like th- for me the inside doesn't fit the outside of the ship it's kind of very cathedrally yeah, inside but um i don't it know it's a cargo ship though I don't know if it's the the hologram characters or or whatever, but like I, I'm waiting for the personality to show up because like again, you want to buy into the ship, and I think every ship that we've that we're reminiscing about right now has had that moment in the show where it's been maybe you know broken, beaten, and scarred, and you know got the crew out of uh, to safety and something like that. Like for example. Um, when the discovery Ships went the around the Charon, you know, and uh, uh, she was, uh, you know, throwing phasers and everything like that, it was kind of really coming into its own. But yeah, the the ships are characters in themselves in the shows, and I'm still waiting on the character of the Last Serena to come to the surface for m- myself. But I'm I'm interested to get my hands on it um, when it comes to the Hero Collector Collection, just to kind of uh, look at some of the other details because sometimes. When you see them on screen, it's only fleeting, and um, yeah, it's still to there's to be huge, confirmed. Huge, yeah, you, when you hold a physical model and you, you, you can see all the different angles, it, it can change your mind on a ship. I think I agree with Damien. I think there's a lot missing inside. I do get like, I think it's because it's empty. I think Damien kind of really hit it there as well. I just think yeah, there's a lot missing from the inside, but it is a cargo ship again, so. Yeah, it should have all that space. It's like technically well, a cargo ship with one guy and he takes on passengers, which he can as well. So, you know, we've got crew quarters, we've got a huge cargo area and that's about it. And it's all kind of like what would be supposedly a small bridge area, which is kind of losing it, that characteristic, I think. There's this thing where, and I, I suppose this is more like a, a story problem than it is a ship problem. And mm. I know it's hypocritical because every 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 ship has a holodeck, or most of mm. them. But I feel like maybe it was a bit of a detriment to the ship itself to have Picard's um, office, like office or room from the the vineyard, be in the ship. Mm. Um, not that I don't like, not that I don't like that, that place, but it's just that maybe it would have, uh, to have like an actual office in the ship or the, like a ready room in the ship. Yeah. Maybe but look at the canteen. Do you remember at the end that, of Picard where they're all, yeah. you know, sharing drinks and stuff? Yeah, that was good. They that's should, where it should have been. They could have done that a yeah. bit more. Yeah, exactly. And I, that's, that, the, if, if you, that's the conference yeah, room. If you look, if you look at the expanse again, you know what I mean? The canteen is kind of like a big area in the expanse, you know what I mean? Mm. Especially fighting over a coffee machine. But again, Lasagna. it gives you that kind of characteristic. I, I do agree. Like the funny thing is, if you look at Deep Space Nine and you look at Nog and taking his, you know, he's going through his emotional breakdown and he lives in a hollow suite and everyone turns around and says like, he's crazy. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you bring that up with Picard, is Picard not a bit, woohoo, you know, spending his working day in a holodeck is kind of, yeah, you know, yeah, that should have been, I think that would have helped a little bit better. I yeah, at, like I know probably saving money. Maybe at the time as well, there were again. I think it was a show that was being rush produced, and um, the set probably wasn't designed. And you know, okay, let's just have it on the holodeck so we can use the existing set house that we're using at the moment just to fill in these scenes, which was probably the real reason behind it. If I was to have a stabbing guess, I'd say that's more the reason behind it. Oh yeah. I think that's what we all said in our like initial reactions or reviews. We just assume not that it's so much like a critique or a complaint. It's just that this is probably the fact of what yeah. happened. Mm. Yeah, and also like I'm not uh, maybe I'm too stuck in the past or I it takes a lot of skill for the actors to do, but I I don't like seeing holographic panels pop up uh, on the bridge as they have been oh, in Picard, yeah. and they're just kind of like tapping at the air. It's like no. Uh, something physical please you know um or have it like a neural link to explain it but just tapping at a, a hologram just i just was a bit messy because you're covering the actor and stuff like that and um well that's a gripe you know. of mine that that's that's something that 
irks me a bit with um and i'm gonna say it's a fault of kind of like modern star trek but then it's not so much modern star trek as it is modern science fiction in general everyone seems convinced seems convinced nowadays that the way everything's going to work is like holographic displays mm. it does like to me it doesn't make sense i don't like it i don't even like transparent screens that much to be honest like phones or or just hollow like transparent computer screens i find it a bit strange yeah. i like panels i yeah. like buttons i know it's not i know it's less dynamic technically to have someone just but, hitting buttons mm. but you know it's funny that you mention that sean because if you look at the trail at the opening teaser for star trek discovery they seem to have addressed that and i think i actually really was blown away by the panel and the communication at the start of that sequence i was like yes this is much better <laughs> than watching somebody playing with tin air um like I, like it's i suppose when you look at the old cars the star trek were always jumping ahead you know touch screens you know Back in TNG days, there was no touch screens. <laughs> Let's call mm. a spade a spade. There was no touch screens. Now there's touch screens. Touch screens are everywhere. Um, like you go to an ATM machine, touch screen. <laughs> you know, it's the simple things of life. We're surrounded by technology that was in TNG now. And I suppose, yeah, you're looking at, you know, this is one of the things with Star Trek has always been like, you know, the next cutting edge. To me, I'm not too keen on it, but I can understand the direction that they're going with. But I have to quietly say now what they've done in Discovery, jumping that far into the future and the control panel, I have been well impressed because I'm like, now that is cool. Yeah, um, like season one and two really Discovery cool. had a good balance where like they had augmented reality on the, uh, yeah, the, the view screen. Had, there were a few transparent panels yeah. in there as well, but it was more more akin to what we would be familiar with with a, a working that's bridge that's because it's set before tos though mm. you know so mm. they kind of they were limited in yeah. that sense when you go to picard though you know what i mean it's you're jumping past yeah the enterprise e has to look more futuristic yeah and it, it you know it, it doesn't do too well on screen and like you know i think even the idea of the hologram you know meeting people and talking to people just doesn't screen well and you know it was a good thing that they removed it um it was covered by captain pike brilliant get rid of it yeah you know we even seen well, it on the defiant it didn't even look great <laughs> when, it, when it comes to when it, well, yeah, well, that was well actually in <laughs> yeah, fairness with the defined one though it was a person standing it there. made more sense because it was kind of like in a in a contained yeah. area i suppose it was yeah. like a holographic display in that sense it wasn't just someone you know and then you don't know how they can sit on the disc that doesn't make sense. <laughs> they would have to have a disc on their end but anyway yeah. um like when it comes to holographic um kind of like controls um i think and like i'm sure you know some actors nail it better than others but i like i always go back to alan tudyk in firefly i watched this behind the scenes where alan tudyk which was the pilot yeah. in firefly explains that he was so much a fan of what he was doing that he started inventing his own. He was like, this is, these are the three buttons that I press to make the ship go forward. And then he said, these are the three buttons that I push and then I turn this dial and this is how I turn. And he started inventing his own kind of controls that he would stay consistent to. And he would mm. do, and I, I don't require all actors to do this, of course. Like, if you want to do it, it it's mm. fun, but it adds so much. It's like every time this maneuver is done, Alan Tudyk was doing this push of a button. You can't really get that kind of stuff with, like, holographic displays. No. Because, of course, they have, yeah. have nothing in front of them. But it's... So I, think the first doctor, I think the first Doctor Who kind of... Uh, went down that route route with the TARDIS if I remember rightly you know he was mm. very finicky and he knew what controls did what on his TARDIS he was very animated mm. about that and then I think as well if you look at the first episode of Voyager where they're kind of like shaking around and they're going all over the place and like I think Robert and Garrett had previously said they never got the TNG uh, shake training you know what I mean how, how yeah. to you know shake around so if they were put through their course then <laughs> you know after the the pilot episode and they even i think on their podcast they, they go back and look at the first episode we we're just kind of throwing ourselves around here there and everywhere it looks ridiculous but then when you go <laughs> into the episodes after they were trained how to you know the ship's getting hit by a phaser you know what i mean or you know they have to move yeah <laughs> it looks a lot better so yeah there's a lot to be said for uh just doing things very very simple like how, how do you train actors how to exactly where to touch in tin air in like air, do you yeah. put do you put like a plastic panel in front of them that you can remove would probably be better because then at least it's consistent 
<laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I, it's, it's a hard one. Yeah. Well, then you give a lot more work to the CG artists because it, it becomes, uh, you'd have to like completely remove an element and then put a, uh, like, and then add the CG rather than just adding the CG. Mm. I think what they do is they basically design uh, all of the CG elements around the, the gestures that the actors yeah. have done. Mm. They just base themselves exactly. on that. Once we don't see too many little holographic heads featuring in Picard again, it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what's in the uh, next season. <laughs> Well, they've changed. They've changed showrunner. They have the showrunner from... Have you guys seen 12 Monkeys, the TV no. show? No. Okay, well, he's he was a big fan of Star Trek before. Uh, he was a big fan of The Next Generation. Um, and so he, he, he wrote, and I think he was executive producer on 12 Monkeys, and he's replacing Michael Chabon. I forget his name, I'm sorry. But anyway, he's replacing Michael Chabon. Mm. And he's... Um, He's very anal when it comes to like details and continuity and stuff like that, Ooh. which is good. So <laughs> always, yeah, <good>. maybe, <laughs> yeah, may, maybe there'll be a um, a bit of a difference, kind of like how we noted there was a difference between the first two seasons of Discovery. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Interesting, but it's it's, it's great that but, we're in this golden age of tr Star Trek now. Um, you oh, guys yeah. have been spoiled with Lower Decks. We've missed out on Lower Decks. Um, you know, we've got Discovery starting next week. Uh, Friday. Woohoo! Um, and then. Well, Lower Decks is a double. We'll, we won't talk too much about it, but it's a double golden age because it's it's the new golden age, but it's also the, the golden age of the nineties. So it's, it's yeah, double nice. gold. We've got Janeway coming back with Prodigy, which is which is absolutely fantastic. You know, so we've got all these shows lined up. The, the Section Thirty One show has kind of gone quiet, and to me, I don't think there's any harm. Like to me, if 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 I was to like put an X through one show, it would be the Section Thirty One show because I think if you're going to do a Section Thirty One show, maybe do it after the Enterprise E era. To me, doing a Section Thirty One show in the the Discovery timeline just doesn't work. That before they jump forward, and mm. um, Strange New Worlds is you know it's it, that's perfect um, trek. You know, so we've, we've like, you know, the shows that we know that are coming, like it's Strange New Worlds. We've got another season of Picard coming up, you know, Discovery. So, you know, hopefully a full year of Trek will be absolutely fantastic. But like with what's going on in the world at the moment, will they be able to pull it off and have a Star Trek slot straight in after Discovery? <laughs> Hard to say. Um, fingers crossed, hopefully. Um, Strange New Worlds. Mate. I don't want to put um, I don't want to put Robert Hewitt Wolf on the spot. Um, because maybe maybe this information is outdated, and I'm pretty sure I don't know, I don't know if he's actually involved with the production. But when when we had him on Trek Chat uh, a, a while back, he did confirm that Section Thirty One was happening. Mm. Um, because he said, "Oh, he, he, he's well, you know, some of these guys in the industry they they, they know each other and they chat." And so I think he was he's kind of he's he's he just he confirmed that it, the show is con it's happening. Mm. So um, Good. we'll see. We'll It'd see be an interesting one. It's one that I kind of like. You know, you've strange new world set in that time period, and you've got section thirty one. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It, look, at the same time, is we'll it's, see what they do with it, it. Exactly, you know what I mean. It, it, give, give the show a chance. I'll, I'll, I'll be tuning in to see see definitely. Like uh, Michelle Giorgio, if she if she's in if she's on it, absolutely fantastic. Um, just curious to see what they do with it. Um, it's got potential. It in line, um, mm, it's different me, avenue. I just think it's just a little bit out of place, but. Oh, wait and see. Give it a go. Mm. We're um we're coming up to an hour, so we're probably going to end this. But I'm going to hit you with a question. Okay. I think I know what you guys are going to answer because you guys are pretty old school. <laughs> sometimes when it comes to Star Trek, <laughs> but view screens, windows or no? Ooh. <laughs> Pros cons. What do you guys think about view screens? Having like a, a window like we saw in uh, in Discovery or in a lot of modern Star Trek, or do you guys prefer the old school? But they're like they're holographic displays, basically. I like Ho grids. I like the Discovery um, view screen. Um, yes, there's a window there, but yet it's done out as a view screen. So I think with the Discovery, I think it's done really, really well. Um, uh, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Discovery. I think the Discovery nailed it. Now, like with with. The Enterprise, not so much as it's illuminated on the outside. But, yeah, no, uh, I'm going to go with Discovery's view screen, and that's probably going to be a surprise, but I just do like the way, if you look at the outside of the ship, uh, and it's a window, and that is your view screen, and I do like the displays that 
come up inside so no i'm actually a fan of the discovery view screen so i'm gonna go with that one actually i like the the windows but i'm gonna go with the classic view screen because the the kind of logical part of me would say it makes no sense to have a big uh, panoramic window on your command center of your ship uh, especially in space when shit's like so far away pardon my friend sorry <laughs> um yeah, but um you know like imagine we're talking about future track there about you know holographic screens uh, popping up in front of you but like imagine what you could do on a bridge if you had like a wrap around uh, digital display that had like depth of field and stuff like that but um you know i, I you know, just going back to my um tng days and you're seeing the big baddie on screen you know it was very cool very personable chat as well you know when you're talking to like your opponent on the vorcha and stuff <laughs> like that or whatever it may be um one to one uh but yeah old school digital uh view screen for me <laughs> And on view screen with the Enterprise, though, I, I I want to see the blast shield kick in <laughs> for, for the bridge. You know, as John John designed it. You know what I mean? I want to see I want to see that gone. You know what I mean? For an episode going, Ali. You know, okay, there's Klingons coming. Like you know, okay, blast shields, the view screen. You know, and have it. You know, blend in with the hull on the outside, which I think John had. It's in the design for it, so it'd be interesting to actually see that. That would be really cool, and you kind of go, okay, the window now works. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Damien has made a fair point there, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, space is space, you know what I mean? Looking out the front window, uh, it's nice, but, you know, that's what Time Forward is for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, in TNG, um, bloody Jordy has to get off the bridge and go to, he, he goes to, like, the conference room and looks out the window or something at some point. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, there is an episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which hey, is did fine. It in Discovery as well. Uh, they no use Giorgio's uh, telescope. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so windows come in handy every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Just not on the bridge. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Especially in Discovery, you've got all of those space clouds. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All those blue <laughs> space clouds. Yeah. <laughs> if, you can, if you can get past the blue filter. Yeah. <laughs> if you can get past the. Blue... <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining me. This was great fun. Thanks for having me, um, Sean. Right back at you. Yeah, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Please, uh, please do go and subscribe to their respective channels: the Irish Tricky, the Trek Collector. They're also on the Twitters, uh, even if they're not the most active. Well, actually, no. By the time this comes out, you'll be all over Discovery. You'll be talking about Discovery. Oh all the yeah, time. yeah, yeah. We 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 go into hibernation every now and again. Um, unfortunately, like Lower Decks has been kind of like a, a bit of a bummer because we we haven't seen it, so we can't really. So sometimes as well, you, you kind of duck social media. I know even with Linda, um, another co-host from uh, the Nerdscape podcast, like you've probably Thursday night, we will disappear <laughs> until we actually watch Discovery <laughs> on Friday. And it's just, look, I'm never going to be one to give out about anybody, you know, causing spoilers on the internet. I think, you know, let's call a spade a spade. If someone is going out and throwing spoilers out on the internet, it shows that they had love for the show and it's just unfortunate uh, you know that we can't all be in sync with one another especially in this day and age which oh soon, soon. yeah hopefully you know what i mean they uh, they announced um they announced that paramount plus and so i'm assuming oh that, i you told know, you all this would happen i told that'll you harmonize all everything all happened and merge yeah but in fairness now maybe not the interest of, maybe not straight away but i think that eventually paramount plus will will manage to get like star trek all of star trek internationally and we'll be able to like get get like um releases internationally yeah for everyone the same day Hopefully same it's, a, it's, it's another subscription you just go jesus but like at the other side it's, it's just, a star trek one though well it's, it's more than just a star trek one you see the whole thing with the the the, the viacom and the whole thing the merger what it just gives cbs so much now to put on a platform because you got to realize that how many paramount movies have been made over the years and then the interesting thing is like how is that going to affect the likes of like what we have over here one of the tv it will be sky so like sky movies is probably going to take it a hit you know what i mean like you say well don't need sky movies anymore let's let's cut the package down to bare minimum because we've got paramount plus <laughs> mm. you know you'll have every single star trek movie and there's there's much much more on paramount you know what i mean they've they, they've been making movies for donkeys so it's it's an interesting uh platform which is gonna have so much to offer um and not just the shows you know what i mean i think they're even going into i think uh, american football and stuff like that as well is going to be part of the platform it's mm. gonna be interesting 
Alright. Okay, well, hopefully I can have you guys back eventually for a Trek chat, and uh, hopefully we can get Linda in as well. Oh, absolutely. Big time. And, uh, yeah. So, thank you. Live long and prosper, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, continue wearing masks, people, because, yes, the, the COVID situation is still ongoing. Uh, wash your hands, and uh, be kind to each other on the internets, and maybe try not spoil too much, just in case. <laughs> Alright. See ya.